Good afternoon. I'm so thrilled to be here today. We are going to have one amazing and powerful conversation. Because one thing I know that we are all going through in this last crazy year, year and a half, has been COVID and how it affects our families, our children, students, etc. So I thought what would be amazing is if we could get somebody who had some real wisdom and experience in that place, in that area. And today we are very blessed to have Karen Kreitzer here with us. And uh, as I introduce you to her, she's not just a school psychologist, but she has been rewarded as the School Psychologist of the Year. And she is also currently the president of the Howard County School Psychologist Association. And that means that she takes all these issues to the state on the state level. Um, she's been doing this for 19 years, right, Karen? Yes. Amazing. So she's super qualified. But before we get serious, I want to have you get to know her a little bit. So first, you're a mom. Can you tell us a little bit about that part? Yes, I'm a mom to two boys. Uh, my youngest is in fourth grade and the oldest is in the seventh grade. And I also have three dogs, which I apologize ahead of time if you hear them barking, <laughs> um, but two Klikas and a Lab. Excellent. And we do like to have a little fun in here and let everybody get to know people. Last year, uh, last week, excuse me, we had the chief development officer of the House of Ruth and her confession was that she also was an owner of multiple snakes. Now, I know you don't have snakes, but you have a very fun side to you connected to the Baltimore Ravens. So before we get into all the deep stuff, could you let people know that you're human and you're actually a blast and what else you do too? <laughs> sure. So I... Um... I've been a Baltimore Ravens coach uh, for the cheerleaders for the past 20 years. I started as a cheerleader myself for five years. I was captain of the team. I got to travel um, all around the world um, with the team. And I got to cheer at the Super Bowl when we played the Giants in Tampa Bay, Florida. And then as a coach, went back 12 years later and was on the sidelines of the Super Bowl uh, when we were in New Orleans. And so that's my fun fact, something that keeps me grounded and it brings joy to my life. Excellent. So, um, yeah, you've got beauty, athleticism, and brains. You, you're like the triple threat right now. It's really awesome. So thank you. And I just, you know, we're going we're gonna to have some really serious conversations. And I also just want people to know I've known you for, we just figured out we met in 1996. So she's amazing. She's really going to help us today. And I know this is something we all need. So you are a school psychologist. And I know a lot of people get a little fuzzy around what that is versus a counselor, et cetera. Can you share, you know, what exactly you do and maybe even why you chose to enter that field? That would be great. Sure. So I just want everyone to know that school psychologists are mandated in every public school. You have your school counselor, you have your social worker, um, but we are, we are school psychologists. So our primary role is to provide a range of psychological services to students ages birth through 21. So we specialize in the assessments and interventions of educational disabilities like learning disabilities, ADHD, autism, intellectual disabilities, and emotional disabilities. Mm. And in addition to conducting the psychological assessments in the school setting, we also provide the counseling, individual counseling, small group counseling. We write behavior plans. We consult with teachers, administrators, community providers, parents, and we offer strategies for learning and social emotional issues. So our goal is to remove any barriers that students are experiencing so that they can access education. That is awesome. And uh, you've been doing this for a long time and now COVID came along, which presents a lot of craziness for everybody. I mean, kids have to get used to virtual schooling and also kids with special needs have to get used to virtual schooling. And I think that those challenges are different. I mean, they're challenging across the board, but maybe you could take a minute and just talk about some of that. Absolutely. So I, I first want to say that students are so different, right? And in Howard County, we have 57,000 students approximately. So we have had some students who excelled in virtual learning. You know, our, our world shut down March 13th. Mm -hmm. um, everything changed. And we didn't know. We were navigating unchartered territories. So we've had some students who have been very successful. But I think that we've had many students that have struggled. And the biggest changes that we've seen as a result of shifting school to virtual learning 
was including the number of Ds and Es that students were earning for their grades. Even students who were previously excelling, who were in gifted and talented classes or taking AP courses, they're really struggling to be engaged in the learning, um, to navigate all these online platforms of Canvas and Blackboard and Pear Deck and all these new ways to learn, but it's a lot to manage. Students' attendance also dropped significantly. And there were a lot of barriers to accessing online learning because sometimes there are a lack of resources at home, like lack of internet or Wi-Fi, Chromebooks. Um, but we've also seen an increase in homelessness due to financial struggles, um, due to parents losing their jobs, domestic violence increased, parental substance abuse and use, but also family separation, not being able to see your loved ones for birthdays, for holidays, for all those transitions when you've graduated eighth grade and you're going into high school or you've graduated the fifth grade and now going on to middle school or even our seniors who missed so much of their years, proms, um, you know, it's just so much, all those rituals that we've all experienced and have the memories of. Uh, so a lot of that grief and loss could not be processed in a typical way when we're in school. We also had a lot of students who were receiving mental health treatment before and suddenly that stopped. We couldn't see students face to face. Psychiatrists couldn't administer medication. Um, so that was a huge shift. And then overall, just that isolation and disconnection from peers, from routines, from coaches, from whatever, you know, extracurricular activities, even students getting delayed, getting their license, you know, all those big things that you're so looking forward to getting your first job and suddenly, you know, it's on hold. Um, and we also were at a time that there was a lot of social justice and racism and just unrest in the country. So in addition to COVID-19, we've also had many students struggle um, because of lack of access to healthcare, but also um, just being targeted because of their race mm. uh, it was an additional major issue that it was very hard to provide support when, when we're not in person. And so all of those were big challenges during COVID. So it's so tough. Um, I mean, it is so tough for these kids. And I know like, it's really hard for me as a mom to watch pretty much everything you just talked about, you know? And I know also that kids don't feel connected to the teachers because they're on a screen. So if they're struggling with something and they wanna ask for help and the loneliness, oh, it's, it's terrible. And, and I know I get batty from all this, so I can't imagine being a teenager. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so absolutely. That connection was missing. Um, our staff, you know, normally in a school, there are so many eyes on a student that we can pick up if they're acting differently, if, um, if they're just having a bad day and just need to talk to someone. We couldn't do that. All our student, majority of our students have their camera off, their microphones off, they're not engaging. And so it's really hard to know what we can help with when we've been disconnected. Um, and students are, the, the services that they need, especially for our students with special needs, are getting delayed. So that speech and language therapy, that occupational therapy, the specialized instruction, um, you know, not all students learn the same way. And so it, it's been a huge challenge. Um, and, uh, you know, but I, I do think over time it's gotten better because we've hopefully figured it out somewhat, but it's still a, a big struggle. So that's um, the really difficult, challenging part for the students, the teens, the kids, all that. There is some element of good stuff, though, also. So maybe we can take a minute and look at what are some of the positive things that have come out of all this? Absolutely. And it's so important that we all every day think about the positives. Um, you know, we have two ways to look at a situation. And even when we talk about mental health issues, one out of four students has a mental health diagnosis of depression or anxiety or some, some mental health diagnosis. But you can also say that three out of four don't. Um, we, we all struggle with mental health issues. Doesn't mean it's a disorder, but 
mental health is part of overall health. So part of, you know, just recognizing that there has been positives as a result, and that can help our mental health. If we only focus on the negative, if we only focus on the losses, that is going to impact our overall mental health. So what I've seen as a school psychologist from a staff perspective, our staff has increased their technology expertise 200% or more. They've learned new and engaging ways to provide instruction virtually, and it's very hard. It has, you know, it has forced some teachers who weren't comfortable with certain uh, technology platforms to, to learn it. And so they've become more organized in some ways and more creative. Staff have found ways to support students beyond you know, thinking outside the box. We've made home visits. We've connected with students in other ways. Thank goodness for FaceTime, um, texting students, calling home. Before it was this barrier of you can't, we only see them at school. The pandemic has forced us to connect in other ways mm -hmm. that um, is more hu human, on a human level. Um, and so, there are some positives. Also, the schedule, you know, our high school students were going from seven in the morning till 2.30, six classes a day. Um, now the schedule changed that they were taking four classes a day. So they were able to focus more deeply on one subject. They consistently saw their teachers every day because in high school and some middle schools, some subjects you see every other day or you have it for five weeks and then you don't see them again for another 10 weeks. So there's no consistency. So with virtual learning, majority of schools changed their schedule where so that students could see their teachers every day and that they could go into the curriculum a little bit more deeply. And the support was offered on a daily basis. A lot of students didn't take advantage of it, but it was offered. And other positives that I see for students is that it really forced them to use executive functioning skills. And these are skills that we learn throughout our lives, but they, strength, they become strengthened as young adults. Really, when you go to college, you start managing your time. You have to manage your time a little bit more. No one's telling you, what to do all the time. You're, you start to learn to think for yourself and, and show more independence in learning. And although for some of our students, it was premature to, to force them to do it, it's given them more skills to, to prioritize assignments. What do I do with more free time or downtime? Many schools have become test optional. So for some of our students who are applying to college, that was a really good thing that they didn't have to take their SATs hmm. and um, you know they could focus more on their transcripts and all the other extracurricular activities. So it reduced the anxiety level of having to get the perfect SAT scores. And then our students are so creative, they found ways to connect, having Netflix movie nights, doing games online, um, and some really learn to advocate for their needs. And so I do see that there, there have been positives. It's interesting what you said, because a lot of people, when they go to college, then it's like the reins are off. And, yeah. <laughs> and you well, see all this independence, yeah. I don't know what to do. I mean, I don't have a class. I have two classes today. I'm used to going from seven to three, plus yeah. then sports after school or theater or art or dance. And now, what do I do with all this time? So it's, it's in some ways it mimicked um, a college schedule a little bit. Yeah. More. Yeah. So um, one of the things now is I, I know, you know, I, I, like I said, I'm a mom, you're a mom. We all have our friends that we talk to and we're all going through different things. You know, I, one of my very dear, dear friends has a kid with special needs. And so she talks to me about what she's going through. And, you know, then I talked about what I'm going through and, you know, sometimes our kids inspire us and sometimes we're scared for them and you know it's really hard because there is no handbook or precedent for this it's not like you you know if you're a mom you can ask your mom well what did you do when there was a pandemic and they shut down schools I mean nobody's really lived through this so you know what I find is none of us know what we're doing and that's the common denominator no matter what our kids are going through so if we're parents and we're watching our kids be affected, whether it's emotionally, socially, um, academically, whatever the case is, what can we do to help our kids? We're not psychologists, we're not, you know, with your world of expertise, what can a normal mom or dad do? 
Yeah, absolutely. It's we are all in the boat together. Some of us are under a different storm or, uh, you know, it's, there's so many, so many analogies that you could use. But yes, we're all in this together and, and we don't always know what to do. Um, I, you know, I'm going to share some basic tips that I think Great. Can, can be used for many different situations. But I think number one, stay calm, listen and offer reassurance. Our children are going to follow our reactions. They're going to react and follow our reactions. They learn from our example. So be aware of how you talk about COVID-19 or how you talk about sexuality or how you talk about drug use. It, I mean, this could, you know, again, generalize to many different uh, areas that you might be concerned with your child. But any discussion can increase or decrease the child's fear. So always respond with truth and reassurance. Focus on the positive. Celebrate that you've had more time to spend as a family. Try to make it as fun as possible, however you define fun. Try to um, sing, laugh, go outside, connect with nature, exercise, but you have to model it, right? So it's not enough to say, oh, do this but do it with your children if the time permits. I do know a lot of parents work and you're like, where am I finding this time? Um, but try to connect and, and allow older children, I think this is really important to connect with their friends. It might be virtually, but you can also find creative and safe ways to do it in person, outside, somewhere, somehow. It is so important for them to connect. You know, it's always important to establish and maintain a daily routine. It gives a sense of security and safety and predictability in a time when there's so much unpredictability and, 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 um, and anxiety in the world. And identify projects that might help others. You know, what can your child do in this time to help others? And offer lots of love and affection. Um, I think it's important that physical affection, even for our older boys, I will snatch my seventh grader and just give him a little rub on the, you know, and he hates it, but it's important. Um, monitor television viewing and social media. I know we've heard this a million times, but really monitor um, what's on the TV, both for yourself and for your children. So watching continual updates on COVID-19 might increase fear and anxiety, especially if the child is already experiencing that. Share developmentally appropriate information or information that's designed for their age group. Sometimes we treat our kids as, as young adults or, or, or adults and we forget that they're maybe not developmentally ready for it. Sure. I think it's really important to um, dispel rumors and inaccurate information um, and take time to talk. Let your child guide the questions. Don't offer information that they didn't ask for. Let them, you know, answer their questions truthfully, but don't offer unnecessary details or facts. Uh, don't avoid giving them information um, that experts indicate is crucial to your child's well being. Um, you know, children and youth don't talk about their concerns because they don't want to worry you as the parent, or they think you're going to freak out and overreact. And so, you know, it, it really let them guide the conversation. Um, and, a, and remember that a sense of control reduces fear. So what can you control in their, in their daily life? I think it's really important because I'm a school psychologist. So I'm going to say, stay connected to school, find out what the resources are, is school providing lessons that address self-care and mental health and social connections? Um, there's a lot of online platforms that are free right now that are offering this type of service that before it costs a lot of money. Um, and identify who else is providing this emotional or social or academic support. Stay in touch, reach out to the child's teacher if you have any concerns. Um, and um, you know, some other strategies are just model basic hygiene, because when we're out of a routine, it's easy to just, oh, you didn't brush your teeth for the third day in a row. Make sure your students, you know, your children are still practicing basic hygiene, healthy lifestyle practices, good sleep routine. Sleep is so underrated, but it is the number one factor when mental health suffers, 
sleep can suffer. And without proper sleep, you're not going to feel well. And that goes uh, for children as well. I think my number one is be aware of your children's mental health. Um, most children are going to manage well with the support of parents and other family members. Even if they're showing some signs of anxiety or concerns, like they have trouble sleeping or concentrating, they will manage. But some children, they have more intense reactions, including severe anxiety, depression, even suicidal behaviors. And the risk factors can include a pre-existing mental health problem, a, a prior traumatic experience of abuse or family instability or loss of a loved one. So please contact a professional. It could be a social worker. It could be a counselor. Your school psychologist is often an untapped resource that many parents don't know about. Contact if your child is exhibiting these significant changes, eating, sleeping, irritability, um, with social withdrawal for more than two weeks, I would say that's definitely a time to reach out. And school psychologists are free too. So they're free. Yes. Thank you for saying that, Leanne. I want you to know your school psychologists are mandated in every school by law to provide psychological services. So they're there. It's free. Um, and even if it's not to go through with a psychological assessment, the resources, the counseling, the direct me to this outside provider. We work with so many counselors and therapists and we can connect you. We're also connectors. And so please reach out. And then one of the other things I think is, you know, cause I've, I've picked your brain a little bit. I'll confess guys. I mean, it's good to have a friend like Karen. So <laughs> is maybe, um, you know, we had chat a little bit about reevaluating things. So I'm one of those awful moms. It's like super strict with my son about how much game time he gets and screen time he gets and all that. But, you know, the truth of the matter is you and I were talking and, um, you know, he's an only child. So I would hear him and he gets on one of the, I'm, I'm not cool. I don't know, but he gets on one of those platforms and he's gaming with all his friends and I can hear his laughter and he sounds so happy that we kind of like peeled back on the rules a little bit because I'm like, I want him to be happy and I know he doesn't have sports and all that stuff. So, you know, when we, you and I were talking, what are some things that they can reconsider, tighten up here, loosen up here? You know, what would you say for teens especially? Yeah, I think it's, it's important to readjust expectations. Uh, I think it, routines are important, but maybe bedtime is a little bit different than usual or weekends are less uh, restrictive than usual. Or, um, you know, ask, ask your child what they need, what they want and within reason problem solve uh, to try and, and compromise on making it happen in a way, again, that your family feels comfortable and it's safe. So everyone is so different. And especially with COVID, yeah. family comfort level of who can come to the house and what can you do, but maybe there are activities that you hadn't thought of that are safe and can incorporate peers um, and your child might just have the answer. So I always say, listen, um, but yeah, just expectations and, and let them be with their friends in whatever way is again, safe and comfortable for your family. It's so important. And um you know, just acknowledge that for some students, this has not impacted them very, you know, drastically or at all. Some really have thrived with being in online school because school sometimes was the stressor. A lot of social issues, a lot of academic stress. So we do have to be mindful of that. But some, again, the transition coming back to school is going to be difficult because we've been out of the of the school routine for a year. Yeah, let's talk about that because I know again, you know, from talking to a few of my friends, some of the kids are dying to go back to school. Like they want to be back yesterday. And some of the kids, honestly, they don't want to go back to them. It's depressing. It's harder for them to be in that environment. Um, you know, I, I know at my son's school that that I found out that they when the kids were there because they were going on a hybrid model. They had to take pictures of the kids when they were eating their lunch to figure out in case they had to trace back. And I mean, the whole thing's so crazy. Like, I don't know what it's like because we're not allowed there. So I know that, like I said, some kids really want to go back. Some kids would rather stay home and just be like virtual and not go back. And then we got some that are confused. What? Let, tell me your view on re-entry, 
from the school perspective, what do we do with parents? What do you do if your kid wants to go back or doesn't want to go back? Help us, Karen. What do we do? <laughs> I mean, is it, am I on for another five hours? Because this, this is going be- <laughs> to Normally we have a time limit on this, honey. You can talk all day because I know that every single person watching this is like, yeah, what do we do? What do we do? <laughs> It is so difficult. Number one, I mean, it depends on the child's developmental age. You know, for our younger students, um, this might have been their first opportunity to enter school at a preschool or a kindergarten level. And so, you know, they don't know what they don't know, which could be a plus. So you're re-entering and you're teaching the new expectations and they don't know the difference. But for our older students, um, I think it's important to, again, make sure that routines are taught and retaught. There is, There are going to be differences. They're going to be wearing masks. They're going to be socially distancing. Their desks, desks are going to be apart. Um, there may be more emphasis on hand washing or hand sanitizing, um, eating lunch outside, if that's possible, or at in, in separate desks instead of tables. So giving them the heads up ask the question of your school. What is recess going to look like? What is lunch going to look like? How are transitions in the hallway going to happen? Uh, What if my child needs to use the bathroom? How many are you allowing to go in the bathroom? Is someone monitoring the bathrooms? Think about all the other things that are going on in a school. Even where do they enter the school and how do they get dismissed? All the usual procedures are going to be different. And so you want to ask, ask, contact the administrators and ask. They're all uh, planning that right now. Many school systems are going back March 1st on um, a part-time basis. Some have opted for five days a week, some two, one or two. But it's important to know ahead of time so that you can communicate that with your child. I think knowing something ahead of time reduces anxiety. You can anticipate it a little bit more of what it's going to be. And and be realistic that it's not going to be typical school day, what you're used to doing. Um, You know, I work in a high school that we have close to 2,000 students, Mm. only 77 parents have opted to send their students back to school starting March 1st. Really? 77? 77. So if you think about it, class sizes are going to be tiny. Um, Teachers are still teaching to students who are remaining virtual. And you have students that are coming two days versus coming five days. So there is, it's just, I think you have to go in with an open mind, um, not expect what was, but ask the questions, um, contact the teachers. And um, I think the the major focus at first is going to be to reconnect, to reconnect with teachers you've never met in person, to reconnect with students in your class. So a lot of social emotional um, strategies, we're gonna expect that students might be really fatigued You know, they were able to take a nap in between classes before. Mm -hmm. Some students didn't have school on Wednesdays. Wednesdays was their asynchronous work day. So they, most students took, they thought of it as their day off. Um, So they might be sleepy. They might be restless. You're used to getting up, walking around, your camera's off, um, TV's on. I mean, it's just a different, again, a different environment. Most will bounce back just fine. But I think it's important instead of, going right into the academic rigor, at least for the first week or so, take time to reteach the expectations, focus on that emotional well-being and reconnecting, getting to know each other, you know, and then moving into um, introducing new academic contact and new academic uh, content and routines. I think that's an awesome point. I mean, I know my son's school is getting ready, I think April-ish to go back. And you're right. I hadn't really thought about, okay, well, the, all the kids are going back, dropping them off, picking them up, like all that kind of stuff. And if we don't know what's going on and our, yeah, yeah I mean, I can completely see, like, if we feel really comfortable, like, okay, here's what it's going to be. We can talk to them and let them know. And, you know, and then when we're talking to them at the end of the day, we can really be getting input on how they feel instead of, well, what happened? <laughs> yes. Exactly. And, I, you know, I think for some students who need more support, 
it's absolutely fine to contact the teachers, say, can we get on a Google Meet before we go back to school in person? That's a great idea. And, you know, have the, the, your child there and have them ask questions. You know, if they're too nervous, you can speak for them or have them, you know, connect with their teacher before they come in on the first day. But I think the more information you have as a parent, you feel more reassured, the child feels more reassured, but there are going to be those things you didn't think of. And so, you know, asking your child, you know, how did they manage lunch? What did it look like? Are you all in line? Do they bring the lunch to you? Or who are you sitting next to? Again, all those things um, are going to be different. And if we kind of know what's going on, it's probably going to be easier for us to communicate and for them yes. to talk about everything. That's incredible exactly. advice. Okay, so then here comes the doozy, all right? <laughs> so we've been talking a lot about the kids and that's obviously, you know, for everybody who's watching this, that's a parent, you know, there's nothing more important than your child. Like you run through fire for your kid. I mean, it's the way we all feel, but there is the parent issue. And uh, one of the things that's interesting is I mentioned to a couple friends of mine that you were gonna come on here and they were so excited and like, oh my God, I can't wait, I can't wait. I really wanna hear it. And then we gave people the opportunity to submit questions. And initially, nobody wanted to submit questions and I was floored. And then once one person did in front of somebody else, then another one and another one, and then they started to snowball. And what I realized out of this experience is that a lot of the parents are unfortunately and completely unjustifiably ashamed or embarrassed about what they're feeling like as a parent and that this is a really big challenge to all of us and look I mean I worry about my son everybody's worrying about their kids but then it's unless you're superhuman there have to be points where I know I felt like am I doing it right am I screwing up like <laughs> what am I supposed to do and I think some people maybe don't have a comfort zone or friends that they can go to or family that they can go to. They can really say, Hey, you know, I'm having a hard time. I'm trying to, you know, get this all correct. And then on top of it, some parents are having their own mental health issues and emotional issues, and they're trying to keep their kid together. It's a lot. So can you talk about the parents? Is it okay for them? Like, what would you say to a parent who's wrestling with holding it together. And, and not to mention that I was talking to somebody I do business with and she has three kids that go to three different schools. Now they were all homeschooled. She doesn't know how to homeschool anybody and she runs a business. So all of a sudden she's trying to be a teacher. We, everyone has respect for teachers at an entirely different level of the experience. I think I've always loved teachers, but teachers walk on water. So now you're like, I got to run a business. I got three kids. I don't remember how to do algebra. What the heck, you know? So help the parents, Karen. What would you tell the poor parents in this? <laughs> First, take a deep whew, breath. <laughs> Lock yourself in the bathroom and just cry it out sometimes. That's okay. We all have our days when we're feeling on you know, on top of the, we got this, we can do this. And there are some days that if your kids are fed and dressed, good job. And that's okay. So give yourself some slack. Know that this is not, that none of this is normal. Um, you know, don't be too hard on yourself. When you realize you've slipped, oh, the house is getting a little messy. The laundry's piling up, you know, ask for help if you need it. I think that's one of the things that people don't do enough. If you don't have actually people to help, that's okay. It's okay to also give your children responsibilities that they didn't have before, you know, teach them to do the laundry, teach them to clean up a little bit about more after themselves, but take time for yourself. And I mean it two day, two minutes a day, just close your eyes and just think of a favorite place to be, um, eat a piece of chocolate slowly, really Smell it, taste it, be, in, be mindful. I, and everyone always says, what does that actually mean? Um, be in the moment, you know, so stop and literally look at the sunset, look at some pretty flower, breathe in the fresh air, catch your, look at your child and just admire them. Remember them when they were infants, do something just to get away, escape, um, just for you, two minutes a day. Uh, but you know, just know you're doing the best you can. Whatever your circumstances, you're doing the best you can. No parent, uh, you know, every parent, like you said, Leanne, would 
you know, kill for their child. They just love their child. But sometimes we're overwhelmed with so much and you have to prioritize and you have to put, put food on the table. Um, and, you know, our own mental health can be a challenge. So you yourself, you know, make sure that you're getting enough sleep, that you're eating, that you are, are getting outside, even if it's a five minute walk around the, your court. Um, you know, if you have a dog, hug your dog, get some dog therapy, you know, you know, just do something that centers you every day, but reach out for help. There are hotlines that are free that you don't have to be in crisis to call. You don't have to feel suicidal or feel that you are at your wits end. It could just be, you know, this was a bad day. I have no one to talk to. Call, call a hotline number. And it's a confidential. Can you for a quick second there. Can you tell people more about what are the hotlines? What would they look for? How do they find it? Because absolutely, people are aware of that. So a lot of it says crisis chat or crisis hotline. They're not always. They're not only for crisis. That's part of the myth, and people are afraid to use it. They think, oh, they're going to send the ambulance to my house and take me to an inpatient hospitalization. Absolutely not. These are trained counselors that are there to talk to you at 3 a.m. in the morning when you can't sleep and you have all this stuff going on. They can help connect you to a counselor so you can get short-term support or long-term, depending on what you're looking for. But those hotlines are a great resource that are underutilized. Um, and so I think if you don't really feel comfortable seeking out uh counseling or um, even talking to your friends. I think it's a good option to talk to someone that is trained, that can, that can get you, you know, some support and reassurance, but also connect you if you do want to be connected to community providers. Uh, so that's, you know, I think Amazing. you should know that it's out there. Um, and, you know, read articles, read books, childmind.org childmind.org is a wonderful uh, website with many articles on every issue, every mental health parenting um, issue. And it's based on research. There's free webinars. Um, so sometimes it's just reading a quick article that you know gives you reassurance. Um, and so just keep going, you know, know that you're doing the best that you can, take deep breaths, um, and reach out, reach out to your school, you know, uh, supports, who, whomever they are, you might not even know who they are. So get online, go to your child's website, school website, and check out who is the student support team? Who are the counselors? Who is the school psychologist? Are they there part-time or full-time? What programs do they have for parents? I run parent programs all the time. Really? But sometimes not advertised. The PTA might not know about it or it's forgotten to be put in a newsletter or there are so many programs. You're like, I'm tired of going to programs, but you can email the school psychologist or counselor and say, hey, I, can, can we talk? I'd like to run a few things by you. So that advice and support is always there for free. If again, if it's an issue that requires more attention, more intervention, I think Please, the earlier the intervention, the better outcomes. Um, don't wait. You know, it's not, well, they're just a boy. He's just a boy or he's just a teenager or, you know, you know your child best. When something is off, ask, ask the child directly, talk to the teachers um, and, and try to get perspective on, is this an issue or not? But the earlier we address it, the better outcomes. And it's, there is no magic wand. There is no magic fix. Um, it's finding the right fit with the teachers, with the counselors, with the school psychologist, possibly a psychiatrist and many other service providers. So you have to look at the whole child. Don't just focus on one thing, you know? Um, and so work as a team. But then, you know, just the last message, I just wanna say, again, your children are resilient. That's the norm for people to recover from setbacks, traumatic, traumatic um, incidents. People recover, people are resilient. So always focus on what is possible in order to reinforce a sense of control. 
and reassure your child that they are okay and that you will get the help that they need. You're there. The situation will get better. Always offer hope. And it's very important to know that, again, they look for you for guidance on how to react to stressful events. So it's okay if we've overreacted or been anxious ourselves. I think recognizing that and talking about that with your child and why you might be feeling that way can go a long way rather than your child assuming what's going on with, with mom today. You know, is she going to yell at me? Is she going to give me a hug? It's okay to express that you're struggling too. Um, and that, but you sit, you know, things will get better. So I know we are way past our time, but there's one last thing. I swear this is really it. Okay. <laughs> and you're such a great person. I really appreciate this. Uh, I have friends that have kids with special needs. Yes. And I remember there were times, especially when the kids are younger, that, you know, the kid, they respond different to their environment. They process things differently. And, you know, whether you're taking a child to get a haircut or you're going to do something or there's noise or whatever different situations can trigger kids who process things differently. And it's so hard on the child and it's really hard on the parent. And then the worst thing is sometimes another parent doesn't realize what's going on and they will give that parent and child a dirty look like your kid's out of control, you're a bad parent. And I know that as we re-enter, um, particularly I would get, and you can please correct me if I'm wrong, but I would think that there will be some of the kids that have challenges with the environment and other things like that. It may be more difficult even for them. So can you give any words to families on you know, kindness, compassion, and not jump into conclusions and what yeah. can they do? Because that's gonna be really tough. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um... Number one, you know, it's so hard to, it's so painful to be judged and to feel judged. Um, and, and empathy is like a muscle. You need to, to use it and practice it. Some people have a very strong empathy muscle and some not so much. And they're quick to judge and um, think that they would know how to parent that child. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, we're not in that parent's shoes. So number one, just take a step back and ask yourself, what else could be going on here? Um, what am I assuming right now? Am I assuming that this child is, is spoiled or that this parent doesn't know how to control their child? I mean, even listen to my word control. Um, you know, some parents do believe that the children need to be controlled and that um, you, you do it in a certain way. But just be respectful. I mean, what can you in that situation do, um, even just as an observer? Are you giving a dirty look, which will definitely not make that parent feel better? The child can sense as well the way that you're looking at them. Even they, may, they might be having a meltdown because they struggle with sensory processing, um, new environments, the fear of a doctor. I mean, who loves going to the dentist or to the doctor? I mean, we all have our, you know, issues, but we, we can manage it in some ways better than some students who are still learning and they need a lot of support. So please don't stare. Maybe ask, how can I help you in a respectful way? You also don't want to overstep your boundaries and start going into a story about your cousin who has the same issues. And maybe that's not the right time. But always, you know, think what else could be going on? Um, how can I help this parent? Um, and, and just, rec you know, show kindness. It goes a long way. And instead of that parent going home feeling so defeated and judged, that, that kind smile or reassurance that you can give that parent, that, that's, you know, can do a lot of, um, a lot of good for people. So, as much as possible, stay non-judgmental. Try to put yourself in their shoes. And, um, you know, it's just, it's tough. For parents who struggle with students who have a lot of anxiety about returning to school, um, like I said, the more proactive you can be, the better. You do have to uh, state the expectation that there is a return to school. Avoiding it only will make the anxiety even worse. Anxiety disorders are all about escape from an uncomfortable feeling or avoiding those intense emotions. So, but how we do it can be gradual 
So maybe they don't go back five days a week if they have the option. They go back one or two days. Maybe they don't go full days. Maybe they go half days. Work mm -hmm. with your counselor and school psychologist. Um, maybe they, you write a social story you know, about the expectations of school. Show the, the students pictures of what the classroom is going to look like. Um, show, you know, um, just who is in the class. Uh, just again, the more information students with anxiety tend to do better, but also taking the pace down a little bit more. But I do believe that the expectation should be there is a return to school. Um, and this is what we're, this is your return to school. It may not be the same as everybody else. And that's okay. You can work gradually towards it as the student feels more comfortable. I mean, you all remember dropping off your child in preschool and there might be tantruming and crying. And 10 minutes later, they're totally fine. Yeah. That's our experience in the school. But it's heartbreaking sometimes seeing your child go through that anxiety. Just reach out to that person in school who can be their safe haven. So even if they're not ready to go to first period, maybe they come to the school psychologist for 10 minutes. The school psychologist can help them with some coping strategies and check in on them throughout the day. I do that a lot. Or I might email a parent and say, your child's totally fine. Everything's good. Whew, the parent can take a deep breath and get back to work. So I do. I work as a team. Awesome. Well, I, I don't even know where to begin to thank you for this. And I know everyone's going to feel the same way that's watching this right now. Thank you, though, because it is an unprecedented, completely crazy time. And, you know, what we're doing is so challenging. But for you, I mean, that's your commitment. That's who you are, that you are on the uh, front line for our kids before and during and after COVID. And I know, I think that this whole experience, like I said, has really made us appreciate teachers more, but it really makes me appreciate people like you because you know you are a complete stand for kids getting an education and being okay. And that's your life. So thank you, thank you. Thank you for going over on time. Thank you for addressing some of the questions that were enlisted. And um, thank you for everything. You're such an amazing inspiration. I appreciate you very much. And I hope you all enjoyed it. And is it okay if they leave some comments or questions below? Oh, yeah, I would love to. If you have follow-up questions, if you want more websites or more resources, um, they're all credible. They're all research-based. I'm not going to send yeah. you to some, you know. So, yeah, absolutely. Please feel free to, to have follow-up questions. So Karen's in the group. And so if you, you know, message her below the this video, then you'll be able to go ahead and she'll be able to pop in and out and answer questions. So I hope this was as helpful for all of you as it was for me. I know I learned a lot. This is awesome, Karen. You're the best. And uh, we will see all of you next Tuesday. And hopefully this will be a really powerful week for your children and your family. So thanks a lot. And again, Karen, thanks so much. Take care.